Okay, let's get into the talk. These slides are free use, so you're welcome to download them at that link and uh, use anything that you'd like. It's a powerful time to be doing environmental psychology. And I wanted to include these three article titles, not, to, not just because people are writing about the climate crisis, we know that from our field, but that these are people in other fields. We have in the upper left, uh, ecology, in the middle, cognitive science, and at the bottom, neuroscientists. These are not groups that were involved in climate change uh, at least very publicly when I started being involved myself. And so this is a very powerful time. The, uh, the science is, the physical science is clear uh, and across the social sciences, people are getting involved. There's a nice uh, momentum. And this momentum extends to the non-scientists as well. So in 2019, I was living in the UK and uh, the Extinction Rebellion protests were bringing people out to the streets that were not uh, experienced at protesting. Um, they were there for the first time and they were, they, they were brought out by the common message that something needed to happen around climate change uh, in, and that something needed to change in the government. And I put up the numbers of arrests here because usually at protests, the people who agree to be arrested is fairly small. And I say agree to be arrested because what typically happens, these protests are, are peaceful, nonviolent, uh, and not that intense. They're, they feel kind of like community events where people are just um, getting together. But the police may come along at some point and say, well, you're blocking the road and please leave. And if you refuse to leave, then they'll say, <clears throat> you do know that we might arrest you if you keep standing here, please leave. And if you say, yes, please arrest me, then they arrest you. This is, this is a, a high bar. And so the fact that thousands of people were willing to be arrested really showcases uh, the broad public uh, involvement in the climate crisis. And so that's the framework for talking about why it's so important for us that we use the best possible methods right now and produce the most useful work to the rest of society. Me personally, my motivation for um, learning more about the methods I'm going to talk about today came a lot from supervising student projects. I'm going to say more about that in a moment. And from my own training, which was that the typical training when I went through as a bachelor's student and PhD student was, uh, is now recognized to produce a lot of false positives. Broadly speaking, we were trained to p-hack. That's not because of any moral failure in the in the previous generation, just that uh, it, it has now become super obvious that the, the standard scientific process as it was practiced for a long time leads to some really misleading uh, uh, conclusions. So what do we do now? Well, there's two groups that I do want to signal in particular that have been very helpful to me and, and also welcoming. And that's the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, um, and the Psychological Science Accelerator. And I'll say more about uh, the Accelerator at the uh, end of the talk. So this is the scientific process, broadly speaking. And uh, you can see that it goes from generating hypotheses up here in the right, all the way around to maybe conducting another experiment and then generating new hypotheses. But in red here, we have problems that can uh, enter into the process. One of the key problems here is hypothesizing after the results are known. If you, if you go back and rewrite your intro to be more um, you know, closely aligned with what you found, that can create a problem uh, about what the, what the inferential tests were doing and how to interpret their results. In the design stage, we're often plagued by low power, which you can get around by planning what the power is before you run the study. Uh, rather than trying to figure out afterwards whether it was sufficiently powered. When the study is run and the data is collected, they're often not documented well enough. And I want to stress the main motivation to document your work properly is for you personally. Like I went back just recently and tried to write up some studies that were from 2014 that I ran. I ran them completely. I had every file that I saved. I had every line of code that I wrote. And there were some questions about that data I could not resolve because I hadn't written down 
enough information to figure out what had happened. Or in the code, maybe I had you know, cleaned up the code so I have this final variable that is a composite, but I don't have the individual things that went into the composite. And so it really is primarily for you, but it also helps other people and other researchers to use your work. At the analysis stage, p-hacking is where we manipulate the process to increase the likelihood of getting a significant result or non-significant, depending on what you were looking for. And the solution to that is also uh, settling what you're going to do in the analytic methods before you do them. In interpreting the results, we have the same issue, which is sometimes called harking. It's an acronym for that sentence. And then at the publication stage, we have bias, uh, so that the only certain kinds of studies seem to get published, like the ones that find significant results. Now, there's a solution to all of these. I'll tell, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But there are also solutions to a couple of them in piecemeal, and so I'll start there. I mentioned that one of my motivations for improving methods came from supervising students. What I was hearing from the students who were writing bachelor's theses with me is that they were really frustrated that their, the largest samples they could reasonably collect, you know, convenient samples of 100 or maybe 200 people, that they just couldn't conclude very much from those samples. They aren't even large enough to stably observe correlations. That looks to be about 250 but definitely aren't enough for complex designs. They felt pressure to find significant results, uh, but they didn't have enough N in their studies to do so. And it makes sense that we ask students to collect data uh, to see a project through from design all the way to analysis. I do think that's valuable, but it comes at a cost. The cost is not necessarily doing any of those steps very well. And so I think my, philosophy about uh, the education of the research process is that sometimes we should be providing students with high quality data up front or showing them where to find it so that they can exercise really high quality research procedures uh, on a smaller part of the process. That's for students, but also for researchers, me and my colleagues. I realize we often don't know what data exists or how to find it. And so because of that, uh, I, I developed a resource I'll show you in just a second. This is just a, a comic, a joke. It's actually originally about climate change, uh, but I, I modified this one to be about p-hacking. I'll let you read it. Yeah, I like it anyway. Okay. So what's our tasty medicine? I'll, I'll show you in just a second an open list of free data, high quality data. Then I'll talk about pre-registration and registered reports as a way to get around the uh, research issues we've talked about, the Psychological Science Accelerator. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how this has played out in environmental psychology specifically. Okay, here's the list of free data that I have compiled with some colleagues and the link there at the top. Um, and what this is, there's about 150 data sets uh, listed that are totally free that you can download and use. Some of them require registering, but they're all free. And what the, the work to do this is to gather them together, but also to include some of this metadata. So you can see that scrolling through the document, you can see what is in the data set. That sounds trivial, but it's actually not a resource that existed before. There are lists of data sets um, but they're generally using the kind of search function, like you'd have to write attitudes and then it'll give you a list of data sets that you could consider. But this, this very bare bones, very uh, shallow interface is actually pretty easy for getting a sense of whether your data might be out there. Um, and this received an award from the, uh, a commendation from the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science last year, which I was very proud of. Okay, so what could you use such a resource for? It has teaching applications in the classroom, like you can uh, make assignments where there's already high quality data that you have selected in advance that's relevant to the themes of the class. Of course, it's useful in more stats applied uh, classes because you can find data that's shaped appropriately for some 
particular model or, um, or question you want to teach. Another use that I've seen that I really think is cool is competitive p-hacking, where you give students the same data set. Let's say you divide the class into two. In one set, you say, please try and find this result any way you can. And the other, say, the other side, you give the opposite. Please demonstrate this result doesn't exist or something. And they can create composites, and they can use different kinds of tests and, and get creative. And it is a great way for them to see how mm, see firsthand what the what it, it looks like when you're p-hacking in a in a safe classroom situation where um, there's no advisor looking after them or anything like that i also have used uh, this list for project and thesis supervision on my active uh, research so last year seven masters and bachelor's level thesis projects uh, using existing data and everyone was happy the uh, program was happy the students were very happy and, and you can imagine why the students are happy because they can ask a scientific question of interest to them and then get inferences from the data that are adequately powered. It's the highest quality kind of work. Um, and it's appropriate for both exploratory and confirmatory work. We often don't do exploratory work because the data is so expensive because we are in a rush but one of the benefits of someone else having collected the data and sometimes a necessity because they've asked the question slightly differently than we would is that you really can dig around and uh, and play and do exploratory work and uh, and sometimes when the data sets are very big one thing you can do is divide the data set in half randomly uh, do exploratory work on one side and then confirm your hypotheses on the other side. And that can be a, uh, a nice way to uh, bridge both of the needs of exploratory and confirmatory. So the resource I just showed you of the data sets, it's not complete. Not all the metadata is filled in. If you have uh, research assistants or students or you, you personally would be willing to spend 30 minutes entering data, I would be very grateful. So please, you can edit that directly. There's no permissions needed to edit the uh, Google Doc, or you can contact me. Grateful for any help, thank you. So Chris Chambers has been a real mentor to me in learning more about uh, research methods. And uh, here's a couple of slides that have been adapted from one of his talks. He often asks his audiences, what part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist? I think a reasonable answer is the results. And then he asks, what part of a research study do you believe is the most important for publishing in top journals and advancing your career? People also say the results, but this implies there is a profound problem in the way we're conducting science. And the solution is registered reports. So how do they work? At stage one, authors submit a manuscript with uh, introduction, proposed methods, analyses, and pilot data. And then that goes to peer review. Now, the, this doesn't have any data in it yet. You've just proposed what you're going to do. And the proposal is very well written. So the, um, the stage one manuscript has a fully written introduction that justifies why the work is being done and how it is positioned with previous work. And it has a method section, which has a very uh, detailed um, analytic method that explains what tests are gonna be run. And it demonstrates that the project has sufficient power for the, the key tests. You know, yeah, this is a lot of work up front before you submit. But there are benefits I'll show you in just a second. Then the stage one peer review uh, is, is, uh, is conducted. And the re reviewers get back. Maybe you do it back and forward. If eventually the reviewers are positive, then the journal offers an in-principle acceptance. Oh, there's a typo there, sorry. Uh, regardless of the study outcome. So the journal says, great, this is well built. We accept your project. Please run it. Then you go off and run it, uh, and then you complete a stage two manuscript. The introduction does not change, or not much. You write the results as you, uh, as you said you would. You write the discussion, and then you deposit the data and materials in the public archive. It's, uh, 
it's a nice writing process at this stage because you know that the paper is accepted and you're just filling in the values that you yielded out of the study. You don't have to oversell them. You don't feel any pressure to, uh, to rewrite the story to match, you know, the new thing that you see in the data. You can write it exactly as it is. At stage two, the reviewers just look to see that the procedure was followed and that the interpretation matches the data, which is much, uh, a much lighter review than most people feel uh, generally when they submit a paper. And then your manuscript is published. Notice that in this process, it doesn't matter whether your hypotheses were correct because the reviewers at stage one already saw, okay, this, review, this work is worth doing, whether or not they're gonna find the answer this way or that way. It doesn't matter whether your results are significant. It doesn't matter uh, whether the results are novel in that sense, like it could be a replication. Now it doesn't matter whether the uh, results have impact, uh, whatever that means. It's more, are these methods high quality and is the question worth, it, worth asking? So do you personally have experience with uh, registered reports? Have you, have you reviewed one? Have you edited, um, have you written one? The reason I started doing this was because I, I began to realize that methods were the one part of the project that I could control. And so I wanted to have uh, more attention on the methods and to be given credit for it. One amazing thing about the, uh, so I've, I've written two registered reports so far. Uh, and one amazing thing about the peer review process is that it felt really different than the other peer reviews I've done. Most of the peer review projects I've, uh, I've ex sorry, most of my experiences with peer review as an author is submitting it and then having the authors come back, the reviewers come back and say something like, well, yeah, it was mostly well done, but this, this was a mistake in the method, or I don't think that this uh, result is very interesting. And you, you're sort of in the position of having to sell the work. And if they identify a genuine flaw, the authors have the incentive in the response to reviewers to arguing that it's not really a flaw. That's a bit of a conflict of interest in terms of expressing the research in the most honest and transparent way. In contrast, in a registered report, like in the first one that I did, for example, one of the reviewers came back and said, there seems to be a confound between these experimental conditions. Like the, there's another difference between condition A and condition B that isn't the thing that's being studied here. And I looked at that and I thought, absolutely, that's true. And traditionally, I, then I would need to have to argue, okay, no, that, see, it's not a problem for reasons A, B, C. But in this case, because the study hadn't been run yet, I could write that reviewer back and say, thank you very much. That's a great suggestion. We've, we're going to make these changes to the method. It was like having a lab group, but informal peer review. And it was very friendly. Like it was, I could be, it was like the reviewers and I were on the same side looking at the work and trying to improve it as much as possible rather than them being a gatekeeper. And that was a powerful experience. And I, so much more positive than it normally feels. Similarly, the experience of the analysis was much more positive. I alluded to this before. Like when you're about to hit enter on that final critical test and you don't know whether it's you know, gonna be significant or not. If the outcome of that is going to change whether your paper is publishable and whether people will listen to you and whether you're gonna get a job and ah, all that pressure, that's very painful. But in the registered report, at that point, the paper's already accepted. You hit return and you get to think as a scientist, oh, is this true? Did we find evidence of this, you know, based on how our methods were set up? And boy, that is a lot less pressure and uh, more why we all got into this job. Okay, so here are the two registered reports. One is, um, I'll, I'll show it to you later, it's uh, about observability on prosociality in, uh, it, with a pro-environmental behavior task. And the second one, which I won't talk about today, is um, testing the difference between tables and text for presenting different kinds of risk communications on harms and benefits, and asking, excuse me, asking which one is better comprehended 
helping people to make informed decisions. And it turns out to be numbers in tables are easier to read than numbers in paragraphs, at least with those methods. So where can you send register reports? Check that link in the lower right. There's a couple hundred journals now. Not that many in environmental psychology, but maybe if we get together and send a petition to Journal of Environmental Psychology um, or something, and I would be happy to um, organize that sort of um, effort, then, uh, then we, we can get more. So 219 journals across lots of fields. I just checked and it was about 300 fully completed registered reports have been published. They're taken off. So now is the time I think we can comfortably say that these are now mainstream. When I was hearing about this work first in uh, 2014, it was still pretty edgy. People weren't sure, why would you do this? Is it weird? It's now normal and it's increasingly recognized as a gold badge of high quality work. Uh, they're also cited uh, well compared to non-registered reports. Okay. So I'm telling you about all this, uh, all these cool methods, but how are they playing out? I can show you a couple papers that have used existing free data and, uh, and hopefully that'll spur us all to think creatively about how we can use the mountain of data that's out there. Um, Kim and Eom uh, is uh, in Singapore um, as a faculty member now, and he and I trained in the same lab. And he has this paper in Psych Science that I really like. It's about the link between, you know, beliefs about the environment and support for environmental action. We can think of this kind of like the belief behavior gap that we uh, know so well, or the attitude behavior gap in environmental uh, action. And he was interested, and he and the team were interested in looking at whether that link differs by country. So the main, um, the main, the bulk of the uh, paper it focuses on this result, where they show that um, the correlation between environmental concern and support for environmental action on the y-axis differs a lot by country. And that's, so that's just low to high. You can see that there are differences between countries and uh, I'm sorry if my face is blocking this, but in the very upper right, way away from the trend line, is the United States. And most of our environmental psych data is from the United States, which suggests that we're missing something about how we're modeling where pro-environmental intentions, support, and behavior come from if the U.S. is an extreme outlier. And then he shows that maybe it uh, tracks this uh, cultural difference individualism. But the point is, he could not have collected data from all these countries and drawn this rat, really cool plot. The, the way he did it was using free existing data. And then uh, they added a second study, uh, I think uh, possibly being asked by the reviewers, um, uh, a smaller lab study manipulating some of these factors. Or, or was it a cross-cultural study between the US and Japan? I can't recall. Anyway, uh, a small study with feasible collection and then this large free data. Another project, uh, this one I was involved in uh, by Ante busik sontik uh, who trained as an economist. We met at Cambridge. He contacted me because I'd done some work about personality and pro-environmental behavior. And we were interested in uh, different kinds of personality and risk concern. Um, on a large scale data set about solar panel installation because he had uh, done some work about solar panels in the UK as well. So we built this model where personality traits uh, might predict um, risk preferences uh, and might predict environmental concern and then all three might drive green investment, so investment in uh, solar panels. And what we found was no personality results, not in Germany anyway. And I mentioned this for two reasons. The first is that the no results are no problem for publishing a high quality paper with decent methods. And we sent this one to uh, Collabora Psychology where it came out. There was no follow-up study in this case. And we used the German house, what was it? The German social household data, which is uh, freely available. So I want to talk a little bit uh, now about the Psychological Science Accelerator. 
and I borrowed some slides from um, Patrick here. The accelerator is a very exciting opportunity that I don't think environmental psychologists are using enough. So this uh, started in part because of uh, Chris Jardier, um, who said it's time to start building a CERN for psychological science. He observed that uh, in physics, they are starting to produce, you know, huge uh, collaborative projects with much better estimates. Like that's to say their measurements are way higher quality and they have a thousand authors or something. And he thought maybe some of our reproducibility and replicability problems in psychology can be addressed by larger scale collaboration. And nowadays, just a couple of years later, there are uh, hundreds of researchers all over the world. And uh, it's really impressive to see all the um, work that goes into sharing studies and materials uh, and making them run across all these different sites for the highest quality inferences. The core principles of the uh, accelerator are diversity and inclusion, um, not just in the uh, membership, but also in the selection of research questions and how they're carried out. Decentralization, there's not a, a leader that uh, determines what happens. It's very flat hierarchy uh, and democratically run. The decisions about uh, the elections and trans transparency around how decisions are made um, and sharing materials is, is all over strongly towards principle of transparency. An, a strong commitment to uh, the best methods wherever possible, and an openness to feedback and iteration. And I think these principles are part of why the members have felt really welcome. Uh, there's no uh, old boys club here. One of the parts of the Accelerator that I personally find most impressive is how uh, they run projects. So. They take applications, which any of you could submit at any time. You could uh, get some environmental psychology work in there. And those applications are reviewed um, by people within the accelerator. And then there, a set of studies are selected for a certain year. So in 2021, they're gonna run some studies. What should they be? And then those studies, once they're selected as being important, then they're run across lots of different sites in a bunch of different languages. And this is just a screenshot of only the languages from B to H, uh, which is just stunning to me that uh, you can get so, such high quality, multi-site collaborative data in a bunch of languages, uh, you know, with these, with these kinds of shared resources. Of course, it means that as a lab, you agree that sometimes you might help run a study locally too. Like you might use your access to participants or your tools, your knowledge to support uh, another research project, which you would then be uh, a collaborator or co-author on. So this, uh, I'm, uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can read this paper called The Psychological Science Accelerator, uh, led by Hannah here. It's, uh, it's come out in 2018, but it already has over 100 citations. There's a lot of attention to this work. And if you look carefully, you'll see my name in there somewhere, although I didn't, uh, I didn't make a big contribution to this helped edit the paper a bit. There are some issues with this large um, collaborative model, and you can see one of them in the, uh, on the last slide. It's, it's kind of confusing how to do authorship because the traditional model for a paper assumes that this small group of people are highly involved, but you can also have a large group of people that are involved at very different levels. Should they all be authors and collect citations? Well, it's a bit uh, controversial and that's a current debate. Another issue with using the accelerator is you would have less control over the process. Like if you agree on a certain set of methods or it goes through internal review there and people decide, well, let's run it this way. It's not the same as running a, a study in your own lab, but you'll get a lot more data and a lot higher quality. Some of the benefits are that the data collected is less weird Weird meaning Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic samples, but not just those groups. Also really any sample that's not representative to the groups that you're trying to generalize to. So that can depend on the research question and the uh, sample you collected and whatever inferences you're trying to state. 
benefits are you don't have to be at a big research school with a lot of money to do big science. And I can't stress more the exposure to lots of great, uh, exciting and excited collaborators who are doing cool work and can teach you new things. I'm learning a lot. Okay, I want to um, swing now in the talk just to show you one final thing to bring you around to how I ended up in a registered report um, in some of my own work. So this is a, a broad model of uh, one of my research lines, which is about environmental issues. You can see that we're trying to predict environmental behavior from a couple different things, individual differences like personality and attitudes, but also contextual variables like social visibility. And that's what I want to talk about today. Social visibility is whether someone else can see you doing a behavior. So, you know, here's someone in a park and uh, he's making, he's drunk a bottle of, uh, of water in a plastic container and he is now making a decision whether to throw it in the trash or in the recycling. And you can imagine that the recycling might be much farther away or he's not sure whether to do it. And the key research question is whether that decision and behavior will change as a function of whether other people are around and watching. And they could be seeing it or they could be hearing about it online or any kind of awareness that other people have of your decision. We have a motivation, a fundamental motivation to feel good about ourselves and our groups. Um, that from my de social identity theory. And it's clear that our behaviors signal our identity and reputation to others. And that's why we select the clothing we do. That's why we speak the way that we do. Um, and uh, this extends to pro-environmental behaviors as well. That's the argument I've been trying to make for a few years now, is that uh, we can look and see when it is that these, uh, these social identities lead to certain kinds of increases or decreases in pro-environmental behavior, either because of internal processes like identity consistency, doing what makes sense to us personally about who we are, but also about identity signaling between people, about demonstrating a certain kind of person or avoiding demonstrating a certain kind of person. And in the upper right here, we have a reusable uh, grocery bag. Lekker means uh, tasty in Dutch. And other people can see whether you bring reusable bags to the grocery. And in the lower right, we have conserving water. And it's a little bit harder to see how long our um, colleagues or friends uh, let the water run when they're brushing their teeth or whether they select certain kinds of cycles on their washing machine that use much less water. It's harder to know that. So we can't observe it as well. Now, environmentalist identity is me trying to find a single individual difference that predicts the very most variance in pro-environmental behavior. And uh, it's, it seems to outperform things like political ideology, gender, um, and, you know, other factors of great interest. And, uh, and join the rank of things that predict pretty well, like environmental attitudes. So on the far left here, we have people that, are, that don't think of themselves as environmentalists. They're not necessarily anti-environment, although they could be. They might also just be, no, that's not my group. And then on the right, we have people that see themselves and want to be seen as environmentalists. And so this work came out of a, uh, a theoretical tradition based on um, the idea that maybe being watched leads to a preference for green products. This uh, early work was hypothetical decisions and using vignette priming, so not the strongest methods, um, but very uh, well-cited paper. And we could call that effect green to be seen. And then on the other side, there seemed to be some work I was observing, which suggested that people would also avoid pro-environmental behaviors in certain cases. For example, in the US, political conservatives rejected an efficient light bulb when it came with a sticker that said, protect the environment but they didn't uh, reject the light bulb when it came without that sticker. So it wasn't about the light bulb per se. It was, about, it was something about what this sticker implies about their memberships. Again, that could be identity consistency or identity signaling or both. And that kind of effect, let's call it gray to keep away, to avoid being seen as uh, an environmentalist. 
So one of the one of the insights uh, of earlier work that I was doing on this was to observe that this is the same effect. This is just I an identity based effect. And so the green to be seen and the gray to keep away are just the uh, different ends of the same spectrum. So in, uh, let's see here, this is the 2018 paper, which we used a multi-level model where we asked people about how visible different behaviors were and how much they perform those behaviors. And then we uh, accounted for a bunch of covariates. And what you can see is that Let's see, how should I explain this? Okay, on the y-axis is how often they did a pro-environmental behavior, where higher is more behavior. And then on the x-axis is how, how much they thought of themselves as an environmentalist. So you can see that, first off, more environmentalist, more behavior, regardless of the behavior. That makes sense. Both lines trend upwards. But they don't trend upwards the same. There's a difference in slope here. In particular, the behaviors that were rated as most visible by the participants themselves, modeled here within the participant, uh, were engaged in less often for people who are low in environmental identity. We called that effect gray to keep away. We saw the effect at the other end of the scale in different samples. Okay, as, as an example of this, I came across a campaign a couple years ago, which I found very interesting run by the um, World Wildlife Fund. They were trying to reduce rhino horn purchase in Vietnam, and their target was wealthy urban men. And they figured, mm, maybe we shouldn't do a traditional environmental save the earth kind of message because these businessmen are not that interested in that group. In fact, they might actively resist it. So the WWF made a weird decision, unusual, and that was, they won't brand any of this, the advertisements that they put out with their corporate logo or their typical messaging. In fact, they just decided, let's do the most effective thing. And they developed a campaign called Chi. And, uh, and they promoted a, a vision of how to be a uh, successful, happy businessman, uh, but without using rhino horn. And so, for example, one of the quotes here is, success and good fortune come with, from within. And it's difficult to, uh, you know, to run controlled experiments across uh, whole countries, but there was a decrease in rhino horn use after this campaign, suggesting that it was effective. So the key signaling finding from this line of work is that individuals may signal social identities with uh, pro-environmental behavior. And because of that, Current campaigns to increase pro-environmental behavior may backfire in people that don't want to see themselves as environmentalists. So looking at these popular labels, for example, we have eco-friendliness, and over on the right, an organic label, which looks like a leaf. I mean, very clever, and it's green, well done. But it's possible that people that would select those products that are interested in the environment, uh, you know, or, or the benefits of that product, now don't select it because it signals the wrong identity because they don't want to be a hippie, earth-loving uh, consumer. It's not totally clear how far this effect generalizes. Most of the data was collected in the US and that's an open question. Uh, the work I just showed you use a 21-item um, a pro-environmental behavior scale. So this is self-report. And, uh, and the scale has a bunch of different components, transportation, diet, education. So instead of looking at what behaviors have the largest carbon footprint or the largest effect on water quality or something like that, we looked at uh, a broad basket of behaviors to try and capture some sort of psychological construct, underlying construct of willingness to do recurring for environmental behaviors. But that has a pretty major weakness, which is that we don't, we already know that um, self-reported behaviors aren't that well correlated with objective behaviors. And so we don't really know the true state of uh, what causes people to do pro-environmental behaviors. So because of that, we, uh, we ran a registered report, uh, me and Florian Lange at KU Leuven, and, uh, and he developed this uh, objective, repeated pro-environmental measure, which I'm going to show you about, show you in a second, and I just think it is so great. I'm so impressed by it. Okay, 
what this offered, and the reason I proposed the register report to him is that it offered a strong experimental test of the visibility hypothesis that I've just explained. Uh, this says stage one accepted, but it is published now and fully available 2020. Okay, so his paradigm says you have to make a series of repeated decisions. You can uh, spend 10 seconds waiting for the next screen by selecting car, or you can select bike and spend 40 seconds until you can go on with the study. So the cost to the participant of choosing bike is they have to wait longer in the study and the whole study will take them longer. But they're told that if they select the car, the fast option, that lights will turn on, physical lights uh, right next to them, and that will waste energy and produce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's a type of pollution. Then they make a series of choices. For example, if they choose bike, then they're shown a screen that shows none of the lights turned on. And in fact, there are physical lights and they haven't been turned on. But if they choose car, then the lights turn on uh, and uh, it shows them how much, uh, how much CO2 was produced because of that. Here's a picture of the lights turned on in the experimental setup. I really like this because it is actual pollution and because, so then it's an objective pro-environmental behavior. And then because it's repeated, you can titrate the waiting time and the amount of lights to get to sort of an individual person's threshold in the same way that you would want an exam to have 50 questions, not just one question, to better discriminate between low, medium, and high performing students. So in this study, we had an observable and a non-observable condition where either they uh, had someone doing a task right next to them who could see what they were doing and who was told what this study meant, what the lights meant, for example, or they were by themselves. And in the upper right, it's just the name of the paper and that the main test was powered at 90% for an effect of D equals 0.5. I realize that's a fairly large effect. The observer could see the target in the observable condition. The target knows that the observer knows what the lights mean. And we did a series of manipulation checks you can see uh, in the paper. So the uh, visibility manipulation seemed to work. And then here's our participant pool, this largely students, largely young. I'll move on. The choice of bike, so the pro-environmental behavior here, was heavily affected by the waiting time, such that when there were uh, longer waiting times, they um, selected the bike less. And the number of lights lit up in the direction you'd expect. And between subjects, we do seem to have captured a pro-environmental task, a, a task that participants felt was environment rele uh, relevant because environmental identity correlated with the bike choice positively. However, there was no moderation. Now that moderation test quite underpowered. As with all two-way interactions, you'll see probably not all of them, but most of them. And here's the critical test in the public versus private condition. Did people choose bike more in the public case? Because this is a student sample in a pro-environmental town with a bunch of people who see themselves as environmentalist. No, in fact, there was no difference. There was also no difference in another measure we collected, which was of uh, financial donation. So how to integrate this? I think there's still wide evidence for pro-environmental pro behaviors being social signaling, but much of that evidence is self-report. Um, some of it isn't. Some of it is objective, like car purchasing, sexton and sexton, solar panels, hypothetical lab purchases. So, uh, it's not entirely clear. The earlier work that I did suggested yes, uh, and the, this replication suggested no, but there are differences in the methods between them that could explain the result in addition to um, one explanation being that visibility doesn't have that effect and the hypothesis is wrong. In particular, this was only one context and they were only being observed by one person and it was in a lab. Maybe they don't care. Whereas uh, in the earlier study, we were asking about visible to all kinds of other valued people like uh, family members and coworkers. 
I would say the next step in this line of research would be to consider what behaviors and to visibility to whom, because they probably care more about repeated interactions. That's what we're seeing from the sort of social dilemma literature in economics than one-off interactions in the lab. But this, the study that we ran was expensive. A lot of work was put up up front to make it powerful. And we were able to submit it as a, as a registered report, which meant that it was gonna be published regardless of the results. So for me, a total success. Um, I mentioned the accelerator earlier, uh, and I meant to put this slide earlier, and uh, you can get involved in various ways. You can join, it's free. You can just say, yes, I wanna be part of the accelerator, and then you're in, that's it. Uh, you can help collect data, or if you don't have resources for that, you can help review studies or give input or, or serve in a different way. And they also have a Patreon, so check them out. And this is my last slide. I just, this isn't relevant to what we've been talking about, but I just want to um, mention this in, in my talks, which is we have a paper out in Nature last year, which uh, suggests that uh, in, a, in a, a huge sample of 80,000 rows um, in the geosciences, women are given fewer opportunities to talk. Uh, members of minority ethnic and racial groups were given fewer opportunities to talk relative to members of um, dominant ethnic or racial groups. And uh, the combination was particularly bad so that women from minorities uh, in particular were not invited as often. And this is, uh, this is scaled to their proportion in the population. So it's not just that there are fewer of them, as a, proportionately, they're also given fewer opportunities and, uh, and I think we can all keep that in mind and make an effort to invite uh, underrepresented groups for speaking opportunities. Thank you very much to my students and collaborators who uh, were instrumental in all of this work. I welcome your questions or feedback on the talk and ways I can improve this um, or whatever comments you want to my email there. And I look forward to the questions and answers now. So thank you very much.